episode 59 of the Pilot the Pilot podcast takes off now. My name is Gene Reynolds, and I've been a a professional helicopter pilot uh, now for about 20 years. What is going on, AV Nation, and welcome back to the Pilot the Pilot podcast. My name is Justin, and I am your host. Today is episode number 59, featuring helicopter pilot Gene Reynolds. As most of you know, I know absolutely nothing when it comes to helicopters, and I felt like it was time to have another helicopter pilot on. So when Gene reached out saying that he would love to come on the podcast, I hit him up immediately, and we had to make it work. Gene is uh, an extraordinary helicopter pilot. He has flown civilian helicopters, he's flown military helicopters, and he's also flown special ops in the military. So, I mean, he has pretty much done it all. I'm very excited for you guys to hear Gene's story, and it's one that I, I'm just very honored to be able to tell and very honored that he was able to share it with us. Aviation, if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can check our Instagram out at Pilot the Pilot. Also, peep the bio. There's a link in the bio for the shop. For a limited time, we're selling keychains, stickers, hats, and shirts. So go ahead and check those out. And if you're interested in buying them, that's where you can do that. And also, you can email me at pilotthepilothq at gmail.com. Aviation, I don't want to keep you any longer, as this is a great episode. Without further ado, here's Gene Reynolds. Gene, what's going on? Thank you for coming on the Pilot the Pilot podcast. Thanks, Justin, for having me. No problem. I'm excited to have another helicopter pilot on. I haven't had one in a, on in a while, and I know I we we're just talking before we started recording how I know literally nothing about helicopters, so I'm just as excited to talk to you as people are to listen to this. Well, thanks. I uh, some days I feel the same way. I know literally <laughs> nothing about helicopters. But, uh, That's hilarious. But you figure it out, right? <laughs> yeah, one day at a time. No, I mean, but, well, flying is uh, kind of like that, right? It's like, well, why did that happen? Let me figure that out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, cool. So let's start from the beginning. Why did you want to get involved in elevation? Or wow, sorry. Let me start over. Elevation. Let's start from the beginning. Why did you get involved in aviation? That's a good question. Um, it, probably in uh, middle school or early high school years, uh, I just I, I thought it was a, a pretty neat thing to do. I, mm-hmm. I was interested in uh, airplanes and the space shuttle, and uh, of course, Top Gun. And oh, uh, wasn't interested in Top Gun, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I thought that was something that I uh, I would like to do. Um, and I had a my aunt actually suggested that uh, if I wanted to pursue that, I should you know try for one of the military academies and then go be a pilot in the yeah. Navy, for, for for example. And uh, that idea really caught caught hold. And so I just started, I set my sights on that. And um, as a junior in high school, I applied uh, to the Na- U.S. Naval Academy. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the um, during the application process, I had, um, there was some issues that they had to, it's like medical issues that they had to kind of investigate further. It wasn't anything bad. It was just some things that they didn't necessarily uh, immediately agree with. And that process took longer than the admissions window. Oh no! And so they said, Hey, you're fully qualified. We've got your recommendations from your Senator. Everything was good to go, but you'll have to apply again next year. Oh. Yeah. So, um, so I applied again the following year and the same thing. They said, we need you to have this investigated. And it's the like same I story. did. I, <laughs> yeah. Don't you remember me? We just talked yeah. like six and, months you know, ago. I, yeah. I still have the paperwork that says yeah. you're fully qualified, but unfortunately the admission window has closed. Oh my God. And so I was crushed. I was a little bit disappointed. And, um, I, so I kind of just said, all right, I'll go to college here at my own, you know, home state school. And, do the thing that everybody does. And <laughs> my, uh, my dad at the time, he said, uh, Hey son, you know, you can <laughs> still go fly helicopters for the army without a college degree. Yeah, and I, <laughs> well, at, at first I was like, who wants to fly helicopters? That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but it's like, dad, um, I want to be in Top Gun. I don't want to fly helicopters. <laughs> yeah. I said, I mean, I, I, and I, at the time it was a little bit, uh, I didn't completely understand it. Yeah. And, um, so my first year in college was a little bit rough. And, uh, so I got to thinking more and more about that option. So I walked into an army recruiter's office one day and said, Hey, I want to fly helicopters. And, uh, he said, okay. And (laughs) I, uh, I just started that process and believe it or not, the army, you know, (laughs) said, you're, you'll do. Yeah. We'll take you. (laughs) Gladly. Thanks for coming in. And so I, uh, I, I entered the army that way as it's called the warrant officer flight program. 
Okay. And some people call it high school to flight school. Some people call it high street school, to sea, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so uh, I went right in and, and started flight school. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. So you said high school to flight school, street to sea. So you were in college. Did you leave college then and join the Army immediately? Or was it kind of like you finished up college and then you continued down the Army path? Oh, no, I was I was already working full time in okay. college and I was only taking a, I, I, the, the college path at the time was not the path for me. Right. And so I left college and just went right to the army. And, uh, you, you know, through this program, uh, you just, it's fairly competitive and they only select a few a year. And uh, so I got picked up and, um, I just went straight to us army basic training. And then I went straight to Fort Rucker where they started warrant officer candidate school. And then I went (laughs) straight into flight school. All right. So it's kind of like a three process thing. So you gotta be, you gotta go to base camp, right? Yeah, that's correct. What, what what was that like? Talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, it was interesting. I just, it's more of a, um, a rite of passage. I mean, they, you'd get a lot of training. It's, it is U.S. military basic right. training and they sh- teach you how to do a push up and how to shoot a machine gun <laughs> and how to throw a hand grenade and how to say yes, sir. And while wow, someone's screaming in your face and spitting all over you. Yeah. So that was kind of an <laughs> interesting, um, yeah. six or eight weeks, however long that was. And, you know, at the time I was 20 year, 19 or 20 years old, I think. And yeah. Um, I, I just, I just took it in stride. I knew it was something that had to be done. So I get through that and, uh, I had done some ROTC stuff in college. So I wasn't a stranger to, you know, military discipline or mm-hmm. the, the military in general. So I kind of had my act together and, and that's good. They, they didn't really, sh- you know, shake me down too much. <laughs> um, and the same thing when I got to Fort Rucker, it was just more of the same, you know, make your bed real neat, clean your weapon yeah. real fast and run really quick and you'll be good to go. <laughs> Keep your head down. You'll be good to go. Yeah, that's right. All right. So you finished all that and now you're finally on to training, learning how to fly a helicopter, right? Yeah, exactly. And this was uh, 1999 that I okay. went uh, to start fly. I had my airplane private before that. I had done that like my senior year in high school. Oh, okay. But, Did you do that in preparation? So you, when you were thought you're going to be Top Gun 2.0? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. So I guess <laughs> yeah. if, we, if we just rewind a little bit, yeah. in my, when I was in the process of trying to get to the Naval Academy, I figured I needed a part-time job and uh, what better place to work than the airport. Yeah, obviously. And, <laughs> yeah. So I went to my local uh, airport. It's probably one of the smallest airports in the United States. And, no, no way. Yeah, it's tiny. <laughs> and I said, hey, I want to fly. And they said, hey, we need someone to pump gas. And I said, cool. So I just traded my paycheck for flight time and uh, grabbed one of the local instructors. And he just got me through the, you know, the quick private program. And I just knew it was something I was going to do for the rest yeah. of my life. Just fly in general. Or at that time, you probably were really focused on flying fixed wing, right? Yeah, exactly. And I was still oh. kind of had high hopes for uh, getting to the academy. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, and so I was just flying a little bit. But uh, then the army thing kind of came to be and, uh, I flew a couple more times and then I got shipped off to basic training. Okay. And then, so now we are back in helicopter training. Yeah. What was, so let's talk about the differences between your fixed wing training and helicopter training, or even more so talk about the difference between how the, the army teaches someone how to fly versus how a civilian is taught how to fly. Oh man. Okay. So I think that <laughs> I know I just is, threw a lot of questions at you, but you take them out of how you want to. <laughs> that's all right. The, uh, the, the question, the, the, the differences could probably fill a warehouse. But, oh, wow. um, <laughs> when I was learning to fly an airplane, you know, and, and you know, this uh, airplane wants to fly. It's naturally stable and for the most right. part. And if you just give it enough power and, and keep it straight, it'll get airborne. Yeah. If you don't uh, do something stupid, it should fly. It pretty much. Yeah. And yeah. if it all kind of stays together. So an airplane was a beautiful thing. It was just like poetry and you just lift mm-hmm. it off the ground and uh, you moved, you know, and it was really, really neat. And there was nothing scary about flying an airplane. Uh, and I enjoyed it. And, you know, the hardest part was landing. Yeah. And, right. and, and so you, obviously you get a lot of practice doing that. I get to a helicopter and, you know, there's about a billion moving parts and it, helicopters are inherently unstable. They do <laughs> not want to fly. They're just so ugly. The ground repels them. <laughs> and, uh, it, it really, gone. yeah, you yeah. just, you just beat the air into submission and finally it gives way and you go, that's l- funny, lift off the ground. And so that was quite intimidating because I'd, you know, I'd never been in a helicopter. I'd never, and, and, and this thing starts up and, one of my first days in flight training, uh, you know, they put you right into a turbine. So we're, we, 
my first time in a helicopter. Oh, there's was, no messing around. Then, yeah, huh? it was like a, it was a Bell 206, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we get out there, and the instructor pilot's demonstrating, oh, this is how we start the thing. And we had gone through all these classes already on how to start the motor, and we get in this little simulator. So I wasn't a stranger to the process. It was right. just now I've got all this noise and vibration and all this stuff going around. And um, he starts the motor, and it doesn't really want to behave correctly uh, when it, with his like throttle manipulations and things. And so no kidding, this mechanic comes out and while the helicopter is running, he opens the engine cowling and he hits it with a hammer. Shut up. <laughs> and, I, and it was like a, a ball peen hammer or, or rubber yeah. mallet or something. And I hear him rap on the side of the engine a couple of times. And, uh, you know, later I found out what he was doing, but it's, at the time I'm a, I'm really like, like we good. Like, should we go back? <laughs> like, all, I think I want to do this fixed wing thing. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden the, the motor starts working the way it's supposed to. And the instructor pilot's like, all right, let's go. You're and like, I'm like what? this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, we take off. He's demonstrating some stuff and, and I had some air sense, uh, you know, uh-huh. I kind of knew what, uh, you know, what up and down pitch roll and you're like, I kind of knew some of that right. stuff, but man, the helicopter just did not. It's, it's so the learning curve is incredibly steep at first huh. because the first thing you have to learn how to do is hover the thing, and hovering, I've heard hovering is very difficult. Yeah, especially in an unaugmented aircraft, an aircraft yeah. that doesn't have you know flight control uh, assist or or any type of AFCS or anything like that. And so it's really like taking a, a sewing needle and balancing a golf ball on top of it. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that visual kind of, <laughs> that's, that's almost impossible. <laughs> so, so really the first couple of weeks of, uh, the week, first week or so of, of flight school is just trying not to die while you're practicing hovering. And first time they take you to this field about the size of two football fields. And he says, okay, keep it inside the tree line. And, and you literally have like 500 feet to play with. Yeah. And over time that size gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And, uh, flash forward, um, you know, 15 years into a career and now, you know, you can do that work completely IMC holding a perfectly stable hover using automated systems and, um, you know, autopilots It's completely amazing what you can do with these things. And so, uh, so anyway, back to your uh, question about the differences, um, you know, the military's flight training is very disciplined. It's very organized. It's very, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it is, it has the flavor of a part 141 program. Okay. It's all written out. The syllabus is there. Um, and, and every day is scripted and you kind of have to, you know, pass certain checkpoints and this and that before they move you on to the next thing. And, and you, okay. you, you know, a month in advance when you're supposed to solo, you know, you know, six weeks in advance when your check ride's coming. It's all very, okay. very regimented. And um, most of the instructors at that time are all Vietnam guys. And so they're very good at what they do, but they don't have a whole lot of um, people skills maybe. And so, <laughs> yeah. you know, some students Go get a really bad yeah. instructor. Some students get really good ones. And you have some guys there that really care about what they're doing. And so uh, I have... My only exposure to civilian helicopter instruction is at the at the advanced level. So, uh, you know, again, fast forward about 15 years, I was a part 135 Czech airman. And so that's the kind of instruction I was doing in the civilian world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, but back, you know, at the very beginning, I think it's somewhat similar, except in the in the civilian world. Uh, you know, a helicopter student's going to start in a very small, lightweight piston aircraft because it's the cheapest one they can fly. Right. And, and it's probably one of the, it's like more forgiving, I would probably imagine. A little bit. And they do a lot okay. of different things with it. Um, and we started in a, in a turbine, you know, aircraft that weighs 3,000 pounds and it's IFR capable and it's, you know, got, it's a lot of other, you carry your stick buddy in the back seat while he's waiting to fly. And <laughs> yeah, so it's um, a little bit different there as far as the equipment goes. And now, you know, U.S. Army flight students are starting out in uh, basically a twin engine glass cockpit helicopter is the first time oh, they're dang. flying. Yeah. And so there's um, a lot of, has changed over the past two decades. Right. Um, but uh, it was, that was a very interesting time and, and flight school from start to finish is about, I think I spent about a solid year at Fort Rucker okay. before you got all the ratings that you needed to finally be qualified. Yeah, that's correct. And they take you all the way through, uh, you get, you know, you go through primary and they, you know, you okay. learn how to do touchdown auto rotations and all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, then you go into the instruments and you get your army instrument ticket. And, um, 
And then you start flying nights and you get night vision goggle qualified and they teach you how to navigate and, and do some army tactical stuff, you know, and, and what they can do at the beginning level. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you get your army wings and you kind of graduate as an army aviator, but you don't know anything at all. <laughs> and, uh, you get to select which helicopter you, you want to fly, uh, for the rest of your career in the army. And, uh, that's usually based on an order of, or like an order of merit within the class. Yeah. So the top guys in the class get a pick or the top gals get a pick, whatever they, they want. The what's order- usually the most requested or like what's the, the most ideal helicopter that someone want to fly? You know, it, it changes. It really does. Yeah. Uh, every class is different and, you know, there's, uh, they'll, they'll come in waves. You know, some students will say, Oh, we want to fly the Apache or a lot of students say, we want to fly the Chinook or the Black Hawk or, you know, it just depends. And so when it, uh, on choosing day or sorting day, whatever they want to call it, the, uh, the <laughs> it sounds ar- like a Harry Potter. Day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the army comes in and says, these are the needs of the army today. We have five Chinooks available, four uh, Black Hawks available, 17 Apaches available. And, you know, it's, it's kind of goes that way. And, and right. you start with the top guy in the class and say, what aircraft do you want to fly? And, uh, when they're gone, they're gone. And so, you know, the last guy in the class or the last gal in the class, they just get what's left over. <laughs> hmm. Um, fortunately I had the option to pick what I nice. wanted. <laughs> and at the time, uh, I chose to fly Blackhawks. Um, that's what I wanted to do. And, um, so uh, I got a Blackhawk transition and right there at Fort Rucker and you, you know, you get your training, it's about six, eight weeks long and they basically give you a type rating in the aircraft. So it's similar to, you know, now having a bunch of experience doing type rating work. Um, mm-hmm. it, it is, it's similar to a ATP check ride uh, okay. and, and type rating in that aircraft. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I do have a question sure. going back a little bit about uh, the training. Mm-hmm. So obviously you said it's kind of like 141. What happens if you fall behind? What happens if you start struggling? Is it like uh, I'm I, in my mind, I would imagine it's not a very forgiving like training. So like if you don't get it once, maybe they'll give you another chance. But after that, it's like, hey, this might not be for you. Like, go hit the front line. Like, you know, like what's the what's the forgiveness like? Oh, good question. And and again, that um, that. um flavor changes depending on the mm-hmm. need uh, the needs of the army and i'm not oh, going to yeah, say they sense. i'm not going to say they change the standard uh but they change the standard based on what they need <laughs> i mean it's the yeah. truth and no yeah. you know the only people who deny it are the army right so if they need pilots and they'll be able to they'll wait they'll give more resources to you give you more time yeah. but if they don't necessarily need as many pilots like no hey we need you over here and 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 so you know uh, at the time i was going through uh everybody was nervous about failing mm-hmm. or falling behind but they do have a pretty good plan in place and so if you're falling behind and you get like every day you get graded and so if you got an unsatisfactory for a particular day of training uh they would it's not a big deal you got an unsat so the next day you just go out and try those maneuvers again uh, all right so you're kind of like stuck on that lesson until you can pass that lesson yep yeah, for the most part right. uh, yeah. and then if you get Three or, I mean, if you got a certain number of unsets in a row, I don't know what the number was, but then they would recommend you for an additional five hours of training. And so that had to get approved through the chain of command. And so you'd go fly probably with a different instructor. Um, and so okay. they were pretty good about, you know, making sure that there wasn't a student instructor problem. Uh, okay. So you'd go fly with another instructor and they'd kind of give you like a progression ride or they called it a prog ride. They kind of wanted to see what the other instructor was failing you on. Gotcha. And uh, so you get that and then they would award you additional time or they could set you back a class, you know, cause they're pumping classes through there. Like, you know, however, ever 24 weeks or whatever it is. Right. And so they could set you back a class or they just let you try the check right again. And, uh, interestingly enough, when I was going through the instrument phase, uh, my stick buddy, you know, there's two instructors per student. And so, the, yeah, or I'm sorry, there's two students per instructor. Oh, that makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> you, you and your stick buddy is what they're called. You, you just kind of go fly together. And my stick buddy was having a lot of problems with the instruments, just couldn't get it. And, okay. um, he was one of the examples where they gave him about three chances to pass his, uh, instrument phase one check ride, his basic instrument check ride. Mm-hmm. And uh, he just, he couldn't do it. And so oh, uh, I just couldn't fly within the standard and, and, and it was just basic instruments. So, I mean, he couldn't hold altitude heading and, yeah. and, you know, kind of the, important <laughs> things that you need to do to fly in the instruments. Yeah. And we hadn't even gotten to really advanced stuff yet, like approaches and procedures. Yeah. And so, uh, so they, 
you know, at the time they cycled him out of flight school and they sent him back to the army and the army uh, got to do with him what they needed. Yeah, and man, so, that stinks. Yeah, it does. But, you know, the, the washout rate or the failure rate was not high at all. You, you, okay. you rarely heard it. It was more common to just have a student get recycled to a class that was further back. You must be reading my mind because I was just about to ask you that question. Yeah. <laughs> how, how common is it? But yeah, that's good to know that it's not. And it's also good to know from the sounds of it, it sounds like they are very forgiving and they're willing to work with you. Because like you said, in aviation, it could just be as simple as this instructor doesn't know how to teach the student. And you know how the military is. It could just be like, hey, it sucks. Too bad. You know, it's like if you don't match that personality, then you're gone. Yeah. I don't know. Now, I just, that's the kind of thought I always had. Exactly. And, and you got to kind of remember, these are all, these aren't dumb people that came to flight school. These are smart guys and gals, mm-hmm. talented and have good careers and good experience. And so the potential is all, they all have the aptitude uh, to be there. And with the right instructor combination and, and, you, and you find the method with which they learn best, you know, if you put the right uh, people together, you can teach anyone to fly and be a good pilot. Right. Uh, and so I, I, sure. I learned that as I matured as an instructor over time. I mean, you'd find people that you're like, this person just is not cut out to fly. <laughs> you could tell probably from the early time, right? <laughs> However. Like, oh, boy. Yeah. However, <laughs> you kind of have an obligation to them to try and find a way, uh, mm-hmm. especially if they're paying money or if they've been put in a position that maybe they didn't ask to be in, especially in the 135 world. You know, you would have some people put in positions that they may not have necessarily been fully qualified for, but you kind of have to find a way to make them effective and, you know, mitigate the risk. And that takes a little skill. Um, and it's not the <laughs> easiest thing to do. Yeah. No, I imagine. I mean, I am very public out there saying that I didn't want to be a, a flight instructor. It was mainly because I didn't know if I would be able to reach people like that. Like if people that I didn't know could figure it out or stuff, if I would be able to put in the time. And I mean, that's not anything to knock me. It's just I realized that flight instructing wasn't necessary for me and I didn't know if I had the right skill set for it. And I think that's important for all instructors to understand that even fixed wing and probably helicopter too, that you need to make sure you're not in it just for building time or creating a better opportunity for yourself. You're in it for the person that you're teaching how to fly. I was just talking with Captain Moonbeam an hour ago on recording another podcast and we were talking about how important is that your first instructor teaches you the right way and how much of information and how much you learn from your first instructor and how it takes a long time to shake bad stuff that you learn. So Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and and good talented instructors are, uh, I won't say they're rare, but instructing is not easy. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I, I love it. It's, it's just, it's my passion and I, awesome. I enjoy doing it. And, but I'm very, very humbled. Uh, I have to always remind myself I'm not the smartest guy in the room. And, <laughs> um, you know, uh, when I, uh, get into, you know, you know, most of my instruction has been at the very advanced level because, mm-hmm. you know, in automated aircraft and glass cockpits, crude environments. Um, but when I see instructors who teach at the very beginning, like, welcome to the helicopter. Yeah. That to me humbles me because that is difficult, difficult teaching. Uh, and, and what you learn as an instructor is that your students will model your behavior or you, they will mim- yeah. mimic your behavior. A hundred percent. And if you don't understand that and if you, you know, cut corners or if you, um, it, it, you just have to understand that they're going to do what you do. And oh, yeah. You have to be professional. You have to know your stuff. Uh, you have to strive for excellence on a daily basis. And if you can just by doing that, you'll teach more by example than you will in just teaching your students how to do yeah. X, Y, Z maneuver, you know? Oh, I a hundred percent agree. A hundred percent agree. And it's hard to hold on to instructors too, because obviously instructors, most, the majority of instructors don't want to be instructors for their whole career. They have more aspirations, you know, they want to be airline pilots. They want to fly for Delta United, 747s, whatever, you know, it's, it's hard to, and it's unfortunate that the the pay is necessarily not there, or I don't know what we, I think that we all need to find a better way to reward the good instructors so we can keep them as instructors because we need high quality aviators being pumped out. And that's one problem with, the ATPs and stuff is that I don't know like they're just constantly moving new new pilots new CFIs and it's hard to tell what the quality is of instruction that you might be getting well you know I, I've, I've struggled with that a lot during my career I've always asked myself that question and on one side of the coin I would always ask why is the youngest most inexperienced aviator teaching new pilots how to fly 
Seriously. And so, <laughs> I, and so I, but on the surface, that's a valid question. Like at 251 hours, you have a job as a CFI and you're within gliding distance of the runway, uh, the entire time that you're teaching. And, you know, I'm being quite cynical here, but, yeah. you know, and so I would always look at them like, why is a, is, why are we training aviators with the most risky person <laughs> in the, right. available? And I said, why aren't people who've been doing it 30, 40, 50 years training and mentoring brand new pilots? And part of it is just that's not the market. No, yeah. one, no one can afford that. You uh-huh. can't afford to pay a 45 year old instructor who's been doing it for, thir- you know, for 25 years because they won't come to work for that money. Right. Yeah. You can't pay them Delta money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I, but then at the same time, I, I've met some of these young instructors and man, they are smart and they're fresh and they're talented and they've just gotten done doing 4,000 touchdown auto rotations. So <laughs> who better to teach someone brand new how to do that? You do have a point. There. So they've yeah. got a very important role to play. Um, and, and so I, I think it, it works and the FAA seems to agree with it and new, you know, pilots getting their certificate are competent and qualified and okay. sharp. And then as you progress in your career, the quality of instructor needs to kind of mirror that progression. Right. You know, so if you want to go get a, a turbine uh, experience or you want to get multi-engine experience or crude or NVG or something like that, you need to, you need an instructor cadre that is obviously qualified to teach that really well. Right. And so, uh, you know, as you move on into these big helicopters that are all typed and all glass cockpit and four axis autopilot and fully automated, you know, you're not going to find a 19 year old CFI teaching in these things. No, <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> and so it, it does the, 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 the market and the industry kind of meet the needs and everybody's got something yeah. to bring to the table. I love talking with junior new flight instructors because they're so full of piss and vinegar and well they're they're hungry you know they're like hungry for that time they're hungry to go do their job and to go get some experience under their belt and they're so smart like they embarrass me at how much they know about the (laughs) basics and you know i can explain some very complex aspects of a advanced aircraft but when they say here, draw the air. You know, talk to me about the lift equation. I'm like, the what? Yeah, <laughs> um, I don't, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, <laughs> it's just that the, the, everyone's got something to bring to the table, and these got yeah. a lot of respect for those uh, young instructors that do a really, really good job. Absolutely. Now let's go a little fast. Let's go uh, fast forward a little okay. bit in your career. So you have your ratings. Yep. You're in the army. What's kind of next? Like right. Uh, deployed right away? Do they ease you into things or it's like no, the fire I, hose I, is going and you're holding on? I, I asked to go as fast as I could, really. I okay. uh, I grew up in central North Carolina and uh, only about... North uh, Carolina? Yeah. I'm so, from Charlotte, so... Yeah, exactly. I, I, I hear uh, you talk about North Carolina quite a bit <laughs> yeah. on your podcast, but... Um, yeah, so I got to choose my duty assignment as well. So I was like, I want to go to Fort Bragg because it's close to my home. And so Absolutely. I got orders to Fort Bragg and I got to go to airborne school and route with me. So I got to jump out of airplanes. And um, so I showed up at Fort Bragg as a young, uh, arrogant Blackhawk pilot. <laughs> and, um, you know, I like where this is going. <laughs> it, it was, it was pre 9 11 and yeah. we were just doing army stuff. We did training and I was trying to progress and trying to figure out how quickly I could become a captain and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, 9-11 happens and we go, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So when are we going overseas? And um, we finally deployed uh, uh, early 2002, so shortly after the the war kicked off. And that was my first uh, assignment overseas. And I flew Black Hawks in Afghanistan for about six months. Uh, what, did, what all did you, I don't know what you can say or what you can't say, but what were your missions like when you were over there? Uh, we did a lot of, um, we did a lot of support, just hauling people uh-huh. around. It's really early on in the war. And, um, you know, so we were moving people, they're building these different sites and outposts. And so we moved a lot of equipment and people, but we also uh, supported the 82nd Airborne Division Infantry and they needed to go places and clear out towns and buildings and mm-hmm. do searches and things like that. So we did a lot of air assault, if you would. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was, I, I won't say it was that exciting or, or high risk. It was interesting, very good time wow. to cut my teeth, if you will, uh, and get some really, really good experience. Flew, flew with some great air crews and, and had a yeah. good, good time over there. Do you have any war stories or like any particular like situations or a particular mission that you can share? Um, 
that was maybe hairier than the other <laughs> ones that kind of perked you up. Like, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, Afghanistan at the time, you, th- you know, believe it or not, the number one enemy over there was the terrain and the environment. Okay. And so we weren't really fighting an enemy that we could see. Uh, but as a helicopter guy, one thing we have to worry about is, is dust. And when you land a helicopter in the desert, you basically enter your own I, your microclimate of IMC 10, right. 10 feet off the ground. It's like your own tornado of <laughs> it dust. Is, it is. Uh, and so that really, you know, there were days where I was like, oh my gosh, that was a horrible landing. I can't believe I survived that. But you're landing. Say, I'd imagine it'd be a very unstable last 10 feet before you land, right? It is. It's quite, yeah. and, and there's obviously technique and learning and skill that goes into it. But And we're flying, you know, analog analog gauges. So we don't have any precision hover symbology. We don't have any, mm-hmm. you know, nice autopilot that, you know, we don't have a hover button in that area. Yeah. You're yeah, a so, war. Yeah. <laughs> like you so, do what you got to do, right? <laughs> so that tour was not, um, yeah, you know, nothing too exciting to report. Yeah. Uh, we, we did fly. I, I was one of my side jobs. I was a life support equipment officer. So we, we were trying to field some oxygen systems for the aircraft and mm-hmm. we did fly a Black Hawk at like 20,000 feet. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't know they could go that high. <laughs> yeah. We didn't either, but uh, <laughs> no, it was, so that was kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, just did, I learned a lot and grew as a junior, uh, junior aviator there. Yeah. Um, but uh, as that time came to a close, uh, we came back home after that deployment and uh, a buddy of mine, one of my mentors early on, he said, hey, why don't you uh, go uh, try and fly for special operations? And I said, well, I need, let me learn a little bit about that. I don't know anything about it. And uh, so uh, as I learned a little bit more about the um, Army Special Operations uh, Aviation Regiment, I said, oh, this is what I want to do for sure. So I put in an application and uh, as luck would have it, they said, we want to interview you. <laughs> I said, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, you know, yeah. I tell everybody every job I've ever held, I've slipped through the cracks somehow because <laughs> I really don't belong. That's funny. And so, yeah. So about, um, you know, two and a half years, I was a, you know, a two and a half year old pilot. I, um, I got picked up to go fly special operations and uh, that was really a, a turning point in my career and a highlight in my career. And, and I also yeah. got, change aircraft. So what'd you change into? Uh, well, I, they, they, I showed up at the interview and the interview is about a week long and uh, it's really intense and it's intimidating. And I don't know if you know much about this organization, but, um, if you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, it's the, oh, yeah. the organization. That's like you know. my only knowledge of helicopters <laughs> is based on Black Hawk Down. So, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's kind of like for the, for the general public, you know, Oh, Black Hawk Down. Yeah. The guys that yeah. flew those helicopters, that's the oh, organization. That was you. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I, uh, you go to this interview and you, you're really humbled and you're, fl- you're, you're really surrounded by a bunch of legends that are telling you how bad you are and uh, <laughs> how, how much you suck at flying and you, you don't even <laughs> belong here. And anyway, so at the, uh, when I got there, they give you this big agenda and I had a simulator period scheduled, uh, in a, in a Chinook, a special operations Chinook MH 47 E mm-hmm. model. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm, I'm a Blackhawk pilot. I, why am I scheduled for the Chinook? And they looked at me and they said, are you questioning our like <laughs> yeah. agenda for you? They're like, you are what we say you are. <laughs> exactly. yeah. I said, oh, no, 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 that this is fine. I'm happy. Yeah, just give me a broom <laughs> handle to fly. I don't care. And uh, so anyway, I assessed for that and um, I got picked up and I said, oh, my gosh, this is great. So I immediately transferred to that unit and started training in the uh, MH-47. And that just was um, amazing. And I spent the next eight years flying for that organization and, and another 10 tours to Afghanistan and Iraq. Dang, 10 tours. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're relatively shorter, you know, some of them were 30 days, some of them were three months long, but you still come and go quite a bit because of the right. intensity. They don't want you over there for quite a long time. Okay. And what so, was, um, I'm sorry to interrupt a little bit, but yeah. when you travel back and forth, what is, obviously you're not flying a Chinook all the way over there. So do you, I, do you fly to Germany and then you kind of fly back over there? How does that process look? Yeah. We actually put the Chinooks inside of a, a C-17 or a C-5 airplane. Oh, gotta love those planes. Yeah. <laughs> and so we would hop on board and, you know, I would, I'd sleep underneath the belly of the helicopter oh, all, all, all the way to Germany. And you would stop in Germany usually and get, you know, refueled or, or whatever. And then they'd fly you into country and you'd offload the helicopter, build it back up and you're flying missions within 48 hours. Wow. Um, 
And so as the war went on and on and on, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that process becomes very streamlined. And we actually yeah. sent people in helicopters over every month. Um, and it just becomes very, very routine. Uh, and, and they've got it. I mean, they've been there long enough. They're pretty much experts at it. Right. So sounds like it. Yeah. So that was an exciting time. And, um, yeah. All right. And then fast forward. So yeah. now we're back from back to you telling the story about you getting a special ops in the Chinook now yeah. and the deployments and stuff. What were those like in the special ops? Oh, well, it was uh, humbling at first. I mean, you yeah. really are surrounded by heroes and legends and guys that had done stuff that can't be written about or talked about. And that's some crazy. really, really, it was just a humbling experience. And I served with some of the best people, some of the most talented air crews on the face of the earth. And we did some really, really harrowing stuff that was, you know, exciting when you look back on it and you go, my gosh, I can't believe I'm alive. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so at first you're very, you are the new guy and you're told to keep your mouth shut and just learn as much as you can. And so mm -hmm. I, I tried to take advantage of that and learn what I could. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at keeping my mouth shut. Oh no. So, That's not a good mix in the army. Me, I, feel like. I, I know I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not the most tactful person in the world and, and I do like to ask questions and uh, they're most of the time they're like dude just shut your mouth and so that's funny anyway so um, that was uh, so our deployments there were, were, were busy and, and it's you fly almost exclusively at night uh, and mm -hmm. so you're sleeping all day and you're flying at night and it gets really really dark in Afghanistan and so there's nights where you're flying and you just you can't even see the ground um, Jeez. I've landed in landing zones that I never saw the landing zone. You just land. Um, and, um, I can, you know, I understand what like a cat three Charlie ILS approach is like yeah. because I've touched the ground without ever seeing. So them. do you just get like GPS coordinates and you know where if they know that that's like a flat spot and then you land or you like, yeah. they know where to hover. So you don't, you could be in the middle of a mountain range and that's you have right. no idea. Yeah. Wow. It gets, it's pretty complicated. A uh, lot, a lot going on. So that was exciting. And then, you know, at night, you actually get to see um, all the people that were shooting at you during the day that you couldn't see because <laughs> you don't really see tracers during the daytime. Yeah. Uh, and so at nighttime was a little bit different and I gained a lot of experience there and worked with some really great people and, and some really great customers uh, and I had a, you know, that was a really, really good time. Stayed really busy and just progressed and matured uh, yeah, yeah, there. And that, that went on until about 2010 and, uh, 2010, I kind of had a, uh, a, a time where I needed to decide what I wanted to do with my life and my career. Right. And, and I decided to pursue more of a commercial. Um, so that would have been the point where it's like you sign up for, was it 20 years full retirement in the military or in the army? Yeah. So I was at the, you know, Fisher cut bait point. I was half, right. halfway through my career. Uh, our op tempo was extremely high. Uh, there were some goals that, me and my family had at the time. We were living on a sailboat. We wanted to go sailing. Oh, oh that's cool. And um, so I said, I, I'm going to separate from the army. I'm going to go pursue, you know, commercial career. And uh, that's what I did. What does a? All right, I've always wanted to know this question, <laughs> and it hasn't really like. So obviously, we talked about this before, and everyone knows. I don't know anything about helicopters. The only commercial helicopter piloting that I've ever seen is down in Louisiana, going to the oil rigs. Yeah, and then also in Mister Deeds, yeah. where really rich people have helicopters and they fly <laughs> them around. Yeah, it's like what? So what does commercial piloting of helicopters look like? That's a really good question, and. Um, uh, ironically, I have flown in the Gulf of Mexico. I've flown out to there the, I've done that particular job and I'll be happy to chat about that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, but believe it or not, there are, are just so many jobs for helicopters. That's awesome to hear. <laughs> if, 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 if you need, first of all, helicopters work in austere environments where they can't get airplanes. They work mm -hmm. in areas where you can't exactly get big trucks. Um, they're doing all kind of construction work, firefighting work, um, power lines, cranes, cranes, the big yeah. crane helicopters. They, yeah. they do power line surveys. Like literally there's, uh, you know, high tension power line guys sitting on the skid of the helicopter, Jeez. working on power lines while the helicopter hovers them. That does not seem like a safe environment. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually the industry has done a really good job of making it safe. That's good. Uh, it takes a lot of skill and talent. And, you know, there's electronic news gathering and there's um, video uh, filming and there's, you know, Hollywood. And, you know, there's, yeah. uh, there's tours. And uh, a really good friend of mine, he flies the camera helicopter for the show Survivor. And he's been doing that for no way. 15 <laughs> years. And I said, how do I get that job? Yeah. It's like, um, when are you going to retire, man? <laughs> exactly. And, and, and now, you know, there's just, if you can, if you you can think of it there. They're doing it with helicopters. Yeah, there's the, yeah. the VIP work and corporate and the really rich people that fly helicopters in and out of the Hamptons. And um, there's law enforcement. Uh, and then, of mm -hmm. course, uh, 
uh, EMS or air ambulance. So those are life flight type deal. Absolutely. Yeah. And then down in the Gulf, they have oil and gas and oil and gas uh, is the Gulf of Mexico is, I think when I was down there, I was reading some report and in 2011, there was over 900,000 helicopter flights that year. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. A lot. It is incredible. And it comes and goes, you know, depending on the price of oil. But yeah. um, I worked down there for about three years or so and did some really, really neat stuff. Yeah. What's uh, all right. So airlines and kind of fixed wing, there's kind of like a set path, like flight instructor, build your hours, regional major mm-hmm. airline. What is, is there a path like that for helicopter? So, so say someone wants to be, get their commercial helicopter rating sure. and they want to get a job. What does it look like after? Like, do they go it, like, Obviously, you got to fly probably out a little sketchier area. Maybe you're flying with a guy with a chainsaw chopping off like tree <laughs> limbs and stuff. <laughs> but like, what's the path for them? How the, do they, is there like a building step to get to the job that they want? The, 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 the typical, uh, path, or I, I would say the most common is flight instruction. Okay. Um, and so they'll just get their commercial ticket and their CFI and then uh, they'll do flight instruction for, to build some time. And, okay. um, uh, there's some people that stay in it. Uh, but, uh, usually then once they get, uh, you know, 500, a thousand hours or so, um, they want to go on to fly a turbine somewhere or do something different. And so mm-hmm. they might move to tours. And so they're flying for a company in the Grand Canyon or they're flying for a tour company in Las Vegas or okay. something. And that'll put them in like a small turbine aircraft and they'll start uh, doing some of that work or they'll, you know, so that is kind of a next logical step might be um, electronic news gathering or something like that. And then they can, you know, a typical, uh, career path might be, okay, now they've got a thousand hours or 1200 or something, and they've got a little turbine experience. Uh, then they'll apply maybe to go fly in the Gulf of Mexico okay. and fly in oil and gas and they'll get put in another small turbine, uh, or even maybe a twin turbine. Uh, or if they're lucky, they might be SIC on an IFR ship. Right. Um, and so, uh, that, you know, they they might work down there for quite some time. There's guys that their whole career is spent in the Gulf. Um, because it's a pretty good quality of life and the schedule yeah. is, you know, 14 on, 14 off. And so, uh, a other path might be they'll go fly HEMS or air ambulance or something. Or if they're real lucky, um, they'll, you know, work their way into some sort of, uh, corporate job or VIP work, um, uh, something like that. And, and then that's, then it starts to branch out all yeah. from there. What's the, what's the pay like as a, is the pay ever get to the point of what a fixed wing guy can make at say a major airline or is it yeah, relative? Ab- it is. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's, it's pretty competitive and, and I'm in a unique position actually. Uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I make too much money to go to the airlines right now. That's hilarious. Uh, well, That's a good problem to have. I, I don't, I don't, I don't say that yeah. like, uh, Bra- you know, as no, I know what you mean. Just, yeah, hundred percent know what you mean. I, yeah. I've been flying helicopters for uh, almost twenty years now, mm-hmm. and I'm at a I'm in a very quality point in my career. I would take an enormous pay cut if I did Rotary to airline hmm. uh, program right now, and I just can't afford it. Um, yeah. But uh, for 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 typical pay, like believe it or not, you know, flight instructors aren't. I don't think are making that much. They're still, I think they're still sleeping on couches and eating macaroni and cheese. <laughs> but, um, but once you kind of start flying tours or get into the Gulf, I, I know that when I started in the Gulf, the, you know, base salary was still 50 plus. Yeah. And for a s- single engine VFR helicopter pilot, that's pretty good pay. Yeah. Um, and 14 and you're only working half the year. And right. So that, and then if you work over, you know, you can make a lot of money working over and you get time and a half or double time. And, um, and then, but no kidding, if you're, you know, some of the heavy IFR captains in the Gulf on good contracts, uh, they're, they're making, um, really, really good money, well over six, awesome. six figures. Uh, and, and so yeah, it I is. had no idea. That's good to hear yeah. that there is, cause I know helicopter getting your ratings is, pretty much double what it is for a fixed wing. So it's good to know that the money's out there. There's a, it's like the risk first reward that there's actually, you, you can make it up in the end. Exactly. And it takes, uh, but it, it takes some sacrifice, it takes a little a long time to get there. Uh, yeah. you know, but, uh, Absolutely. It, it's pretty quality work for sure. And I think that, uh, I think it's a good time for a helicopter pilot simply because a lot of people are leaving to go fly for the airlines. Mm-hmm. And so the helicopter industry is hurting for good pilots too. Yeah, I was just about to ask about the shortage of that yeah. sitting in the helicopter side as well. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, I'm not really in a, 
particular field of the industry to know if there's a big shortage or not. Um, and, you know, if you start looking for helicopter jobs, helicopter jobs are like unicorns. They're, yeah. ha- they're hard to find and they, they're, it's, they're not so much like you just get on a website and apply. Like it's a <laughs> lot of networking that goes on Absolutely. and it's a relatively small community. So, uh, people's names, uh, you know, you, you, you have to be careful about your reputation and, and how you perform. And, uh, but a lot of helicopter jobs, just like airplane jobs probably are, are gotten through a handshake and actually meeting people. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I've talked to, I probably beat it to death in previous podcasts about it. it's, it's really about who you know. It's about getting a mentor that someone that has done this before you to help like, Hey, they did this job. So maybe you can get the job when they leave. And you know, it's just all about forming a community and being your own CEO. It's like, how bad yep. do you want it? Do you yep. want to put in the work to get to a regional airline at age 23 or 1500 hours? Or are you going to be lazy and take your time and not get there until you're 28? You know, you can go one or two ways and there's really only one person that you can blame if you don't do what this other guy is doing on it's on instagram you know it's just like yeah yeah that's one of my pet peeves is i did it too i got lazy when i was flying but it's like it's all on you no one else is going to make excuses for you no one else cares it's like it's all on you you go at the pace that you want to go well it is and you you do you have to you have to get involved you have to educate yourself um you have to meet people you have to uh, you know try and educate yourself on something new every day and i'm glad you mentioned mentorship because uh, you at some point in your career you go from being a mentee to a mentor Mm -hmm. now you can be both i I still need mentors like i i still search for mentors but at the same time i realize that i'm also in a position to mentor others absolutely and so you have to find a way to do that and and give back and, and share some of that some of that knowledge and just going to work every day and being a good helicopter pilot is not enough no. Or being a good f- fixed wing pilot is not enough. Uh, you need to do more. And how you do that is really kind of like your signature uh, to the community. Yeah, I mean, I would totally agree with that. And it's one of those things, it's like everyone has a different story and everyone learns differently. You don't know what you like, you don't know what someone else is going through. And maybe you went through the exact same thing. So you'd be doing someone a disservice if you didn't go out there and reach out and maybe share your story. Or if you went to go talk or you went to go talk to people, cause you don't know the connections that you could form and how you could really help someone. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, let's talk about, you mentioned you wanted to talk a little bit about kind of flying in the Gulf. What was that like? Oh yeah, sure. So I got, um, I was, <laughs> I was living in Mexico on a sailboat at the time and I had taken about, <laughs> sounds like a rough life. <laughs> yeah. I had taken about eight months out of work. And I, when I left the army, I, I had about eight months off and I was just sending resumes. I had no idea how to network. I had no idea how to transition yeah. out of the military. I had no idea about the commercial helicopter business at all. I just knew I put a resume together, a cover letter, and I just started mailing them out to chief pilots. How, how little I knew how wrong that was. <laughs> However, <laughs> Uh, I did email, you know, I, I sent a resume to a company in the Gulf and, and to my chagrin, they mailed me back and said, we would like to interview you. I'm like, wow, cool. So I'm like, how do I interview? I've never interviewed for a job before. That's and, and what so, do I, I was in the army that just like, I went from uh, here to here to here. <laughs> but exactly. Right. And so, uh, so I kind of started talking to some people. How do you interview for a commercial aviation job? And, but they flew me from Mexico to the jobs to the, to Lake Charles, Louisiana. And they, you know, I had to, but what I did is I did a lot of preparation. You know, I knew what I was supposed to wear and I mm-hmm. did some studying and this and that. And so I got there and I had put together this big resume packet and it was really a good experience. And, um, so I'm sitting in this, in this interview and uh, I, I'm happy to talk about this offline or I, I mentor people on this all the time on, oh, on their first job interview. And I'm sitting there, I'm in a suit and a tie and not <laughs> coincidentally, my suit and tie match the company's colors. <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, you know, ironically, they're pretty easy colors to match. And, right. uh, so I'm sitting in the interview and the chief pilot's there and this, uh, the head of HR. And toward the end of the interview, they're like, I noticed you're wearing, uh, you know, c- colors that match our company. Is that because you're trying to suck up? I said, no, I figured I would go ahead and buy my outfit for next year's Christmas party. <laughs> and they thought that was hilarious. That's funny. And then they said, um, you know, they said, where do you see yourself in five years? I said, 
in the five year anniversary section of your company magazine. That's funny. And they're like, Oh my Smart. gosh, did anyone coach you on this interview? I'm like, no. <laughs> and so we had, you know, we had a couple other questions and answers and, and, you know, guys coming at the time, guys coming out of the military were kind of seen as militant and mm-hmm. um, yeah. strict. They, they couldn't think outside the box. So there was a lot of interview questions about thinking outside the box. And so I had to kind of navigate those carefully and kind of explain to them what I would do. Fortunately, my time in special operations taught me a lot of skills of working with very demanding customers. Mm-hmm. And um, I bet, <laughs> I mean, we, we carried, you know, the same customers that, you know, shot Bin Laden in the face. That's and crazy. so they're very demanding. And so I, you know, we, we gained a little bit of skill on how to support them properly. So I think that helped me uh, deal with customers uh, on the civilian side as well. Anyway, so they hired me and they said, come fly VFR single engine in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, so I come in there and I, I start doing that work. And I was like, this is great. This is amazing. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I find myself 180 miles offshore one day in a single engine aircraft VFR (laughs) by myself. uh I'm like, what the (laughs) heck am I doing? I mean, in the army, they barely let you run with scissors. And (laughs) here they're like, go do this work. And so that was a lot of fun. But anyway, uh, about two or three months into my job there, the chief pilot said, hey, I just looked at your resume and I see you've got a lot of experience in special operations work, hoisting, night vision goggle offshore. I said, yeah. And he said, well, we'd like to put you into our new uh, search and rescue division. And so uh, our company was forming the first commercial search and rescue division in the United States. Oh, cool. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that do it as, um, you know, public service, like sheriff, uh-huh. sheriff's department. But ours was the first commercial U.S. organization. And so I helped kind of be a part of that, uh, the team that got that put together and, and we started flying bigger helicopters and we do an NVG training and hoist training. And, and so then for the next two and a half years, I helped run that program and manage about 16 pilots and, and two very capable aircraft. And we did uh, commercial offshore search and rescue services for the Gulf of Mexico. And, um, that was, Awesome because we, you know, every time we flew, it was to a different location. We flew night, we flew IFR, we flew hard IFR, Uh, we did hoisting offshore and a lot of hospital transfers. And and that was just a really, really great time. Yeah, no, I mean, (laughs) yeah, that's, that's cool that you got to do that. I didn't even know that that was like a commercial side of helicopter flying. Cause I, I mean, when you think of search and rescue, I think of Coast Guard, I think of the police, I think of just other forms they don't think of like a commercial side to it so i'm sure that definitely kind of tied in your special ops kind of background a little bit too because you got to feel that you're on a special mission trying to search for someone do anything possible to make sure it goes right yeah and that was definitely some learning curve there because you know the difference the military you know is like so that others may live and we will risk the crew for one person right. but in the commercial world you don't do that no someone else's emergency does not become your emergency and yeah. that's a hard lesson to learn but we did it and we did it safely and we did it correctly and um you know for the goal you know there's on any given day there's probably i don't know a quarter million people working offshore in the gulf of mexico wow and there's you know 30 or 40,000 offshore facilities yeah. and it's a big big place and so the oil companies started to realize hey we need some dedicated assistance like if we have a guy have a heart attack or if we have another deep water horizon event how are we going to get our people out safely and so that's kind of how that whole program was born and, were you uh, flying in the gulf when the deep water horizon happened no no i came on board just shortly after uh, okay. there, there were days where you could still see oil in the water wow. but um but no i came on after that i didn't have anything to do with deep water horizon okay but i did uh just really quickly you remember the um carnival cruise ship um yeah that, that caught on fire off the coast of Cancun. yeah well it had an engine room fire and lost all its engines and generation and Anyway, they, yeah. they started towing that ship back to um, Gulf Shores, Alabama, or Mobile, I think. And uh, But, you know, it was a three-day cruise that turned into a six-day nightmare for the passengers. Jeez, could you imagine? Uh, and they needed some help. Like, they didn't have food. And, and, and anyways, it was a pretty bleak situation. So our company got called for some commercial services. And we started hauling supplies out to that boat about 250 miles offshore. And uh, we worked that ship for... Two days, I think we flew like six and eight hours each day just doing hoist work, 
carrying supplies out to the boat, like food and water and yeah. stuff, or yeah, yeah, just you know, just from a supply ship. That, yeah. You know, so there was a supply ship steaming from Alabama trying to get out to it. So we just started cu- helping cut the distance, speed up the process yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and so yeah. that was really cool. And anyway, so we escorted, help escort that ship into uh, into dock. And that is cool. So that was neat. Yeah. So you so, never you never know what you can do, what aviation can be used for. You know, it's just unbelievable. Oh, it's amazing, and and yeah. the things they do, and and that's always been kind of a goal of my career is to to do something in helicopters that either hasn't been thought of or hasn't been done correctly or safely yeah. before. And, and you're part of a team that kind of pioneers a way to, Hey, we found a way that's safe and effective. That's cool. That's awesome. No, I mean, helicopters definitely, like we talked about earlier, helicopters definitely can do things that trucks can't do. Or airplanes can't do. It's like airplanes can't hover. Helicopters can. <laughs> that's right. That's airplanes right. can land in a four by four foot area or whatever, 10 by 10 foot area. It's like a heli- airplanes can't. That's, so yeah, exactly. you definitely have that on the fixed wing guys. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. there's definitely, you know, like I said, every asset brings something to the table. Yeah. I, I can't do, you know, 400 knots. <laughs> <laughs> no, you cannot. <laughs> but you also probably don't want to do 400 knots and fly well, four I did, hours uh, in a helicopter. I, I was flying across the Gulf one morning. I think it was about two in the morning and we were trying to get to Houston uh, to take a, pa- a passenger to the hospital. And we had a really, really strong tailwind and we were flying IFR. We were up, I don't know, seven, 8,000 feet to take advantage of the tailwind. And, um, we had about a 250 knot ground speed Dang. and Houston center was like, what do you say? Your aircraft type again? <laughs> yeah. I said, oh, you're we're, a we're, helicopter. We're, Gusta, we're, we're, <laughs> we're Gusta 139. And he's like, you must be flying one of the fast ones. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting. It turns into a story or, or a lesson that I like to, to tell, you know, when you're not used to flying that fast, things happen quickly. Yes, know? they do. And I mean, we, we, sh- shoot arrivals and approaches and all kind of stuff, just like everyone else does. But we normally do it at like 140 knots. Yeah. And when you enter the terminal area doing 230 knots over the ground, things happen quickly. Very and fast. I, I, um, that's one of the things I teach some of the junior guys and gals. It's like, look, you need to always be ahead of the aircraft and understand how these things affect the sequence yeah. of events. Absolutely. Um, because if you're not ready for the approach clearance or if you're not ready for join the localizer, if you're not ready for whatever, then things are going to happen and you're going to find yourself so far behind the aircraft that you could survive a midair. Yeah. I mean, that that's how it was for me too, transitioning from a PC-12 into a jet. It's like, I mean, I had one PT-6 on the PC-12. Yeah. I can go fast, but yeah. like things, things happen fast, but not that fast. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a relatively quick plane for a single engine, yep. but then you move into a jet and it's just like, boom, 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 boom. It's like, mm-hmm. all right, you're on departure. Now you're on the approach. Now you're landing. It's like, wait, what happened? <laughs> Especially for very short distances. Yeah. Uh, well, we have some flights that are six minutes. We'll, we'll take off from Oakland mm-hmm. to go, go to San Francisco. And yep. it's like, we don't even put the gear up. It's just like going and fly. They put, as soon as you take off, you get a right downwind and a right base and you're there. And that, it's that's like, wow. I, I teach a class for the FAA on um, flying technically advanced aircraft. And, yeah. um, one of my, and what I teach my students is I said, you, you, it's, it's no longer just time, turn, tune, torque, talk, you know, mm-hmm. it's now you have to ask yourself these questions. Like what's the aircraft doing? What's it going to yeah. be doing? Did I make it do that? Is it really what I want it to do? Like you have to go have this conversation with the cockpit. Like what's going to happen next? If you can't yeah. answer what's going to happen next, you do not need to be here. Right. You need and you're to go, behind the airplane. Yeah, we need to go yeah. back to the classroom and talk about this because yeah. lots of stuff complicates, you know, the complicated cockpits. And yeah. it's like, we can take advantage of all this automation, but if you don't know how to do it safely, then, you know, you got some issues. Yeah. And I love, I think it was like an old American Airlines recurrent. And the, the thing he said, it was an old chief yep. pilot. And he goes, what you need to do is as soon as automation acts up, the first thing you need to do is turn it off. It's like, dumb it down. That's the safest and best thing you can do is get yeah. rid of the automation. I, I, I use that video. Actually, I have that video oh, attached nice. to a PowerPoint that I give awesome. and it's uh, about 28 minutes long and I make my students watch it. I'm like, this is yeah, it's even a great though it's video. From 1997. It's a fantastic yeah. perspective on automation. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. It's really, really good. I'm, I it's heard very you mention that the other day. Yeah, it's, I mean, anytime I don't know what the plane's doing, I trust myself flying. So the first thing I do is I hit that big red button and I'm hand flying. That's right. It's like, I know what heading I need to fly. I can hold a heading, hold an altitude. Mm-hmm. We'll figure out whatever problem we need to do. But the most important thing is flying this airplane. Click, click. 
Yeah, That's we're it. good. <laughs> well, sweet. Is there anything else? I mean, we've been talking for an hour and I know we touched a lot of stuff. Is there anything in specific else that you wanted to talk about at all? Um, no, not not really, unless you have some specific questions. Um, and no. There's a couple more uh, highlights of my career and, and things I'm doing now and what I'm trying to do. And uh, But as yeah. far as the teaching realm Go goes, and, and I'm, I'm in this phase in my career where I really enjoy teaching. I like mentoring. Um, I'm putting together, I'm in the initial stages of putting together my own podcast. Oh, nice. Um, cool. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of my passions is crew resource management. And it's kind of important. <laughs> it is. And, and yeah. you know, when, 80% of accidents are caused by the human, um, we, you know, the industry doesn't, I, I don't think takes it as seriously as they should. No. Uh, and, um, and so I do a lot of work with CRM and I teach CRM and, and, um, you know, so uh, my podcast is going to be uh, helicopter centric, but it'll be CRM oh, cool. centric, safety related, especially from crude advanced aircraft perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, uh, you know, you, you listen, you watch YouTube of, of airline cockpits and, and, you know, they're, they're, they've got the patter going back and forth and they're doing the takeoff and they're doing the, you know, the call outs and everything is so scripted. Yeah, but it's there for it a reason. Yeah. And uh, that, some of that is quite lacking. And in the helicopter industry, uh, some organizations do it pretty well, uh, but within the U.S. specifically, it's it's some stuff that I think uh, we could really clean up on. So anyway, that's something I'm working on, and, nice. uh, and I still teach, uh, kind of uh, do a little moonlighting for a company called Helicopter Institute out of Texas, and we cool. support some FAA instructional activity and, and, and a bunch of other work, but. You know, so. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about the mentoring thing. Cause I'm reading the email that you sent me and you said that you're, um, you do some mentoring from military to civilian. What's that like? Absolutely. Yeah. So every year, uh, there's an organization called Helicopter Association International and they host uh, or they run a conference every year called Heli Expo and it's the largest international trade show in the world. Oh, cool. Uh, and so, you know, it floats around the U S this past, this past, um, event was in Atlanta and, you know, they'll have 60 to 80 helicopters on the show floor and, okay. you know, 150 to 200 vendors and 20,000 people come through the show floor, right. you know, through the week. So it's really big. And, uh, so what they do is they also have safety seminars and classes and all kinds of stuff you can do. And one of the, uh, events I've been a part of for the past five or six years is called the military to civilian transition seminar. And it's a free seminar to, uh, transitioning military members that are trying to get into the civilian helicopter world, um, whether they're pilots or maintainers or operations or anything like that. And so uh, me and a, a team of people, we kind of put on this uh, presentation and, and a mentoring forum and give them some information on how to tailor your resume to how to ha have a professional photo taken to how to speak civilian language as opposed to yeah. military language. And it really gives them a, a bunch of resources that they can use to get their first civilian job when they're getting out of the military, whether they're retiring or separating or, or whatever. It's a great, great uh, event. And um, I enjoy being a part of that. And we do uh, afterwards, we do breakout sessions where uh, the people who are attending the seminar or can, can get some mentorship or ask questions about firefighting or search and rescue or EMS or corporate. And, and so we have specialists from all those different um, uh, kind of uh, aviation specialties to be able to answer questions and provide some mentorship. And we gather business cards and we correspond with people and we provide them direction. And I had a, a couple of people one time said, I, I don't know how to meet so-and-so. And I'm like, well, the chief pilot's right over here. Let me introduce you. And we <laughs> show them how to network. That's cool. And it's a really really good time so that's kind of a big event every year i look forward to doing that well it's something that seems so easy to someone maybe that was in the army or in the military or just that maybe is in the industry and has been in the industry for a while and kind of grown up in the industry but that is something that's like how do i do this it's like how do i start being a pilot it's like what do i do it's like well you call flight school and you go on google and you yep. do that kind of process or how do i get a job and it's like it's just it's it's a lot easier than it seems but you when you don't know, you don't know. Yeah, exactly. And um, and you're right. These guys, you know, even myself included, you come out of the military thinking you're like the hottest thing since sliced bread. Yeah. And you're very proud of your chesticles. And, you know, <laughs> you're you're proud of your uh, your career and what you've done. And, oh, I've got combat time and I have this. Yeah. That, but you don't realize the world you're trying to get into. Yeah, uh, it's and completely so you, different it in the is, military world. And you have yeah. to humble yourself and you have to kind of realize you're starting again at the bottom and, yeah. uh, and, and you do bring a lot to the table, but you just have to learn how to capitalize on that and Absolutely. not just barge in saying, I want to fly your 
you know, Mr. Deeds helicopter. <laughs> Mr. Deeds. Oh, I'm so glad he said that too. <laughs> yeah. It's a great movie. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> it <but. is. laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and get into the rapid fire section. If okay. you don't mind, sure. just got a couple of questions I'll ask you, uh, changes all the time and it's whatever comes to my mind. So to say the first thing that comes to your mind. Absolutely. What is your favorite airline to fly on? Favorite airline? Oh, um, I think uh, based on experience, it's going to have to be Singapore Airlines. Oh, okay. Well, I'm guessing you probably had some business class experience on them. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. it, really short. I was a chief instructor for the Chinook at the Boeing company. Oh, and cool. uh, so when I worked for Boeing, they send all their people business class when they're going overseas. And so, yeah, I made about four trips to Singapore and that really nice. kind of spoiled me for everyone. Yeah, else. absolutely. You can't fly commercial anymore unless it's Singapore business class. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> what is your least favorite airline to fly on? Oh man, <laughs> there's so many. Uh, prob- <laughs> Anything other than Singapore? <laughs> but just based on experience, it's probably uh, Spirit or Frontier. Okay. All right. What's your favorite livery? Oh man, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I like Alaska, um, yeah. airlines when they, especially when they put like the animals, uh, on the airplanes. Yeah, that is cool. I yeah. do like that. What is your least favorite livery? <laughs> uh, geez. Um, I, I don't know. I, I know a lot of people like it and, and it seems iconic, but it's the old Southwest livery, the tan or the brown color. Oh, okay. The, the really ugly one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I know a lot of people are quite fond of that, but you yeah. know, it's just, to me, it's like, eh, their new one is much better. <laughs> yeah. I would agree. They drink the Southwest juice. So for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what? Let's see. If you could fly anywhere in the world, where would you want to fly? As far as being a pilot or traveler? Uh, like you actually flying over a certain terrain, like the Himalayas over Mount Everest, the ocean, you mm-hmm. know, the, the reefs out in Australia. And, you know, uh, like I said, uh, you know, that, that's a tough question, but it, since this is rapid fire, I'm going to have to say the South Pacific. All right. What was the most challenging flying you've ever done? Uh, mountains of Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, let's see. Android or iPhone? iPhone. Mac or PC? Uh, PC, but I prefer a Mac. I just can't afford one right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're stupid expensive. I agree. What is your go-to airport food? Uh, sushi. Favorite airport to land at? Uh, as a pilot or passenger? Pilot. Yeah, as a pilot. Um, man, because uh, you know, as a helicopter guy, we don't always go into these fancy airports. <laughs> but uh, I have been into a few big ones. Um, that's a tough one. Well, I guess, uh, hmm. I, I would say, I'm going to say New Orleans only because I flew in there quite a bit and I did a hard, right. hard IFR and it always worked out. What about a passenger as a passenger? That's your favorite airport. Uh, probably intercontinental in Houston. Okay. There you go. I've been there a couple of times. I was slowing down traffic there when I was on the PC-12. They're like, how fast can you go? Like, Dang it. <laughs> well, they, they, then you hear them go down the line for everyone else. All right, reduce speed, reduce speed, reduce speed. Yeah. It's like, yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> I had a 45-minute taxi there one time, and I had to get Ooh. gas because of it. So, Yeah, that, yeah, that happens every once in a while. It's uh, You never know at those big airports. Yeah. All right, let's see. What else? What else? What is your least favorite airport to fly into as a passenger? Ooh, uh, uh, probably... Um, I'm going to say, you know, it's hit or miss. I, I, I both love and hate Atlanta. <laughs> okay. <there. laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, yeah. I also held up a lot of traffic going to Atlanta cause I was going in there in a caravan and they're like, how fast can you go? It's like, yeah. ah, not very fast. Yeah. Give me your best speed. <laughs> but, uh, best forward speed until a mile final. It's like, right. okay, <laughs> I can do that. That's funny. All right. How about aviation Mount Rushmore? So people from the past future. It could be influencers. It could be Chuck Yeager. Who would be on your aviation Mount Rushmore? And it doesn't have to be, you can just name like one or two or three, however many you want to name. Oh man, this is tough. Uh, all right. So one of them is going to be Frank Piasecki. Uh, okay. he, he actually is the, you know, the grandfather of the tandem rotor helicopter. Cool. And when you see one of those things, the inner workings of a tandem rotor helicopter, you realize how smart that guy was. <laughs> So like, the, dang, he's yeah. a lot smarter than me. Yeah, he he would be one of them. Uh, I think another one would be a, a, a good mentor of mine. His name's Randy Maines, and he has probably the father of helicopter CRM in the United States. Oh, cool! Uh, and so I could I could do another four hours talking about him. Yeah, yeah. But he is uh, he teaches CRM. Uh, he's got a 
big, good. long helicopter career. Good thing you're starting a podcast up, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It'll be one of my first uh, interviews. But, nice. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the when I start to look at other, uh, there's a bunch of other people I could put on there. I've got a lot of people that I've flown with in my career that cool. I'm just like, fine to be amazing. So oh, Yeah, well, that's awesome. All right, last one, actually. Yep. What is the most important thing you have to have on you while you're flying? <laughs> um, whew. Is this like a legit question? <laughs> uh, well, like, I mean, sunglasses are mine because I have to have sunglasses. So you, you can make it whatever you want. <laughs> well, see, I do a lot of flying at night. And yeah. so there, if, if I get into the cockpit without my finger light or okay. without a, a headlamp around my neck, yeah. uh, I feel completely naked and I cannot That's find funny. my mojo for the whole flight. So I, yeah. I, I'd say it's my finger light because we fly in a really dark cockpit. It's crazy how much one thing can affect the whole flight. Yeah. You're like, I don't have my light. I don't know what to do. I don't have yeah, my light. It's, it's, it gets <laughs> to the point where in Afghanistan, we'd carry about eight spares. <laughs> That's funny. It's like a little overkill, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, hey, Gene, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. It was great to kind of hear your your outlook on transferring from military to civilian and how you did and everything you did in the military. Thank you for your service. I appreciate it. I know my listeners appreciate it. Keep and help our freedom. Um, just thank you. I really appreciate you coming on and I can't wait to share your podcast with everyone. Well, thanks a lot for having me. I, I, this is my first podcast interview and well, I'm, you did well. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'm yeah, glad that uh, we had the uh, opportunity and it's been a real, real pleasure. Uh, Good. Th- thank you very much. Perfect. And uh, stay on and we'll debrief a little bit afterwards, but I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Avi Nation, thank you for listening to today's episode. Like I said earlier, if you liked the episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. Check out our Instagram at pilot to pilot our website, pilot to pilot HQ. Dot com, and you can email us at pilot to pilot hq at gmo.com. Hey, Nation, as always, I hope you have a great day and happy flying.